Hey guys, Annie Guglia here. For those of you who don't know me, I'm a skateboarder from, from Montreal. I've been skateboarding for about 17 years. And last year I finished my master's thesis on a business strategy on the skateboarding industry. So I'm gonna talk to you about, about that. So basically I'm just gonna start with like how I got into that subject for my thesis. And then I'm gonna explain the process of like doing that whole research and then the results. I'm going to talk about the results and the implication for research and practice. And basically a thesis is like a really big research project on a subject that you have to find something that people in, like in research or in practice don't know already. I think it was in 2015 we started hearing about skateboarding going to the Olympics. So I was like, how, how are managers, how are people within the industry that take decisions, like decision makers, how are they going to deal with that? So that was like my first, my starting question for my, my thesis. How it works is usually you just start with a literature review. Then that was really good. I'm usually bad at saying literature. So I got it first T. So you go through everything that's been done on your subject in the literature. For my part, I decided to go in four different subjects for the, for the review of the literature. I went to see everything that was, that's been done on the skateboarding subculture. Then I went more into what was interesting for me, so like resistance to commercialization, like the Olympics and stuff like that. Obviously that wasn't in the literature, but um, there's, there's a lot of good research on like how people in alternative sports, how they react to like, even like X Games and ESPN, when it first started, there's been some backlash from that, so it's really interesting to see like how skateboarders, snowboarders, BMX, and like all these uh, extreme sports, how they reacted to commercialization. And then third point is a, just a history, like commercial history of skateboarding. So I'm going through all the phases, phases like ups and down within the industry. And then the fourth point is alternative sports and management, all the research that's been done on action sports and extreme sports businesses. So after doing all of this, all I had to do is do my own research, I guess. So I went through all these uh, researches and articles, like scientific articles about skateboarding, subculture, business management. Um, and I, one thing obviously I realized is that my subject hadn't been covered. So that's good news because sometimes you have an idea and you realize it's been done. Mine hadn't. So my exact question is how do um, managers within the skateboarding industry in North America deal the, the possible contradiction between the business side of things and skateboarding with its sub subculture? Um, so I wanted to see if first there was a contradiction um, that people saw and if so, how do they deal with it? So now I'm going to start um, talking about my theoretical framework. So basically that's the machine that you build or you can just use one that already exists but you build it to um, analyze your data through it. I use a discursive framework by uh, Gian um, that I adapted for my research. So basically Gian um, developed a theoretical framework to analyze change in, in an organization um, and to see how each department adapt to it. Uh, what I did is I adapted that uh, framework to change in an industry. Uh, so to do that, I had to change. Um, his um, framework has four different dimensions that he studies. Uh, so I basically just changed these and adapted it to, uh, to my, uh, the context of my research. This is what my theoretical framework looks like. Pretty cool, eh? So basically what you can see is that there's different um, discourses within the skateboarding industry on the left. Um, there's money, there's um, lifestyle. So those are two discourses that we talk about. And then I want to see how people talk about circumstances, uh, sectorial, I called it sectorial identity, and then uh, individual and organizational identities and practices. That's completely on the right. It's in French, but I think you can still understand what it talks about. So that's how I'm going to analyze my data. Right now, I'm quickly going to go through methodology because it's important to know how I did it. Um, so basically, I started by, um, the, by mapping the whole skateboarding industry. And then I found five different types of 
of uh, organizations in skateboarding. So I found retail stores, uh, distribution, manufacturers, just brands in general, and uh, agencies. And what I did is I found different characteristics to uh, regroup them together. I, I tried to regroup all the little and big companies within skateboarding and uh, in 13 categories. Then I asked for, um, for managers, strategists, CEOs, people that were taking decisions for businesses in each of these categories. It's not to generalize the, the results, it's just to have a diverse sample of businesses for my research. For example, for retailers, um, I had two categories. I wanted to have independent like skate shops and also chains, uh, so I, and, and, and then Canadian and US. So basically that's four categories. And one last thing you need to know about uh, methodology is just that I had 16 um, respondents that I interviewed for 45 minutes to two hours. Um, there's semi-directed interviews, so I had questions, but I still just let people talk about what they wanted to talk about. For some people, we talked about skateboarding in the Olympics a lot. For other people, we just talked about like Nike or uh, or just the subculture in general or about being what, what it is to be core. Uh, so it's really interesting. If you want to go read um, all the results, uh, that's the obviously the most interesting part for anyone in the industry, for skateboarders, for anyone who's just interested in the skateboarding industry. Uh, I invite you to go um, download my thesis. It's in the description, and it's honestly like that part is really interesting. There's a lot, a lot, a lot of information, a lot, a lot, a lot of quotes from everyone, like a lot of people from the industry. Everything is anonymous, so you won't know who's talking. But it's still really interesting to read all the quotes and like know that someone said that, and you can relate or not, and see maybe where you're standing in that in all these results. So that'd be really cool if you want to read them. All right, so let's get to the results because that's what's really fun and that's what I worked for. So <laughs> here it is. Okay, so if we go back to my theoretical framework, you'll see there's, um, to the left, there's discourses. In the skateboarding industry, there's two main discourses that you need to know about. There's discourse about lifestyle and about money. The discourse about lifestyle is what we hear a lot. So it's like about being core, about skateboarding for the love, uh, not for anything else. It's also about um, being skater owned uh, and what you think about it. And every, you have to know that every discourse can be positive or negative. So people can say um, a skater owned company is good or bad because skateboarders don't work uh, or not organized. You know what I mean? So it can be positive or negative. Same thing for money. So. Uh, everything about commercialization, about selling out, about um, money in general can be positive or negative. So what I did is I, I checked how all, the, all my respondents talked about all th these two discourses and used these two discourses to talk about um, the circumstances, about their ident identity, about their practice and about the industry. And that's how I created three discursive profiles. I called them. So basically, they're ways to talk about um, the industry, about commercialization, their profiles of uh, managers within the skateboarding industry. So my three discursive profiles are, and you'll probably recognize some people in this, there's the nostalgics, the pragmatics, and the promoters. Hopefully for um, implications for practice, um, that can help you understand the world you live in, you work in maybe. Start with the nostalgics, because um, they're the majority of my respondent, they're 10 people out of 16, which is a lot. The way that nostalgics deal with this tension between uh, the subculture of skateboarding and the business world um, is basically they live it. So um, there's two types of nostalgics. There's the, um, the ambivalent, Ambivalent? Is that a word in English? Anyway, I'll check it out. <laughs> they live that tension between uh, the lifestyle and money. Um, and when it comes to money, uh, it stands out even more because it's like sometimes they, uh, they don't know how to act. It's going to affect their practices. Uh, whereas the idealists, the nostalgics idealists, um, they would literally bankrupt to stay core. 
so being core is the most important thing for them. It's part of their identity. It's part of both nostalgic's identity, but for um, for the idealists, it's like not even questionable. It's the most important thing to stay core. When it comes to the circumstances, uh, the commercialization, the Olympics, uh, they're against all of it. Um, they want the industry to remain core, and but when it comes to um, the um, industry's identity, uh, the only people for them within the uh, the industry are the core companies. So uh, the ones that are not core, the outsiders, they call them, uh, they're not part of what they call the industry. Uh, so that's also interesting for practice um, because it affects who you want to deal with and how you deal with them. And finally, when it comes to their practice, The way they um, discursively create their practice is that they say that they are in the industry to earn a living. For the nostalgics, they're just they say they're there to they're in the industry for the love. So therefore, they just want to make a living out of skateboarding and not make money. One last thing that's really interesting about the nostalgics is there's they're always looking for core skateboarders support in any practice or anything that they do, they need that, um, that core audience support uh, to legitimate their practice. Pragmatics. Um, they're a little bit opportunist, not in the bad way. They're just, they take advantages of opportunities. Um, and they're, we can, I think we can say they're in it for the money, um, but not in a bad way. Just, they're there to make money. Their skateboarding is an industry like any other industry and they're there to make money. It's not a bad thing for them. They don't see any contradiction. Uh, they don't have, feel any tension about it. Um, so basically the way they deal with that possible contradiction is they just don't even talk about it. For them, it's not even a concern. When it comes to their identity, they're skateboarders, they talk about it, but for them, they just cut their identity in half. So there's the skater. When you talk to the skater, uh, they talk with the heart. When you talk to the manager, they talk about money the way managers talk about money. So it's just two, for them, it's two complete different worlds. And um, skateboarding is an industry, but skateboarding is also their passion. But there's no contradiction. Whereas in the nostalgics, you could feel the tension. For them, when you talk about the industry, it's the commercial side of their life. So they just they talk about it like they talk about their job. They talk about economic analysis, business opportunities. They use the, they use the money discourse a lot uh, because when I ask questions about skateboarding, for them, it's their job. Um, the only time they would use the, um, the lifestyle discourse is when they had to talk about themselves or legitimize their practice. Because uh, sometimes um, they'll talk about stuff like, let's say, like some practice that they do that are really... Uh, about money, but in the end, they always have to use this lifestyle discourse to remind their audience that they're core. And finally, the promoters. So the nostalgics would live the tension, um, the pragmatics would just ignore the tension, whereas the, for the promoters, they see the tension, but instead of treating it like a tension, they use it at their advantage and they turn it into a virtuous circle. So basically what they do, if you, if you talk about them, about their practice, They'll say, um, yeah, we're in it for the money. We're making a lot of money. But what we do with that money is we give it back to the skateboarding community. And that's how, that's how they legitimate their practice. When these managers talk about, about the industry, they're basically saving. So when they talk about other big companies, because most of the time they're big companies, when they talk about other big companies, they say they're, they're like the guardians of the skateboarding industry. When they talk about their their identity, they say their core, and they say they're in it for the money. So they'll use both discourse, but both discourse will be positive. Um, and that creates that virtuous circle that I was talking about, um, because that's how they legitimate their practice. Um, but that's also how they describe the industry and their own identity. So it's really interesting to see the promoters uh, talk about how they fight for skateboarding, how the, they're like guarding the core side of skateboarding while making a lot of money. Um, so yeah, so they just don't live that tension like, like the nostalgics. 
One last thing that's really interesting with the um, promoters. Well, I thought that was really interesting. Um, there's two ways of seeing um, core. Some promoters will say that core is poor. Um, so they have to sell out. They have to sell out to make money, but they'll use that money to bring it back to the core and try to make it grow. Whereas other promoters will say that core is everything. So they're investing a lot, a lot in core so to make it to the mainstream so that the mainstream thinks that it's cool and buys everything. Um, so that's two different ways. I'll let you think about it. Uh, if you have any, uh, anything that you want to say about it, please leave a comment. So I found these three uh, discursive profiles that are um, nostalgics, pragmatics, and promoters. Um, there's a discussion about it in my thesis. I won't really talk about it because I think everyone can have their opinion. I found some implication for practice and for research. Uh, so if you're, um, if you're skateboarder interested in research, if you're, if you're doing a research on skateboarding or on the industry, uh, or if you work in the, this industry and you're interested in, um, in these things, you can um, download my thesis. It's in the description of the video. A really short summary of <laughs> what I found in my thesis. And there's three different ways to deal with uh, the commercialization of skateboarding uh, for uh, managers within the skateboarding industry. So either they, um, they live the tension, they ignore it, or they just turn it to their advantage uh, in a virtuous circle between money and lifestyle. So yeah, so that was it. If you liked my video, uh, please give it a thumbs up. Also consider subscribing because I'll be posting uh, more videos. And also if you have comments or questions, uh, I invite you to put them in the, um, in the comments below. I'll try to answer everyone's comments and questions. Uh, hopefully this video was helpful if you're, uh, if you're studying the skateboarding industry, if you work in the skateboarding industry, or if you're just interested in it. Um, yeah, so I hope this video was fun. Cheers!